Thank you, Carlene, for that music to start us off on a beautiful morning. Good morning. I'm Vanessa Cowie, and I have the pleasure of being your worship associate today, along with Janice Cannon. <laughs> I'm hiding her. Our women's service has become an annual event in the spring, and today our particular focus is on welcoming and honoring women. And we welcome all of you, regardless of your gender, race, ethnicity, age, how you identify whom you love, or what spiritual paths you may have traveled. We are glad you are here. Our congregation grieves together and celebrates together, both in this sanctuary and in the fellowship hall and in our neighborhoods and community. The candles burning here represent joys and sorrows that we honor this morning. Those shared on paper and in email as well as silent ones, I have only one that's pre-written, but no, that we all have joys and sorrows in our hearts, and we honor them all. This particular one is a candle of joy for John Austin's birthday. Happy birthday, John. I'd like to recognize our minister, the Reverend Bob Rangillian, who is here in the sanctuary. And Donna Rayburn has an important announcement about our spring auction. Donna? Good morning. Good morning. Would you use the mic? I'm a member of the auction committee, and I wanted to tell you. Donna, could you use the mic just so everybody can hear? Come up here, sure. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I've never been up here. <laughs> <laughs> Only one more week to donate items and events. Donations close next Sunday, April 21st at noon. Plan to attend our opening night celebration, which is Friday, April 26, 5 to 7. Don't forget to register to bid. If you bid in any in last year's auction or any other fundraiser, you are good to go. Auction team members, hello, <laughs> there we go. We'll be, we'll be available after church and to answer questions and help you register. Thank you so much for all your support. Thank you, Donna, and thank you, auction team. I am honored, humbled, and deeply grateful to be able to introduce our guest speaker today. Uh, a native of Western North Carolina, the Reverend Carter Hayward is a feminist liberation theologian, a priest, and author whom we are fortunate to count as part of our UUTC community. Hayward, um, in 1974, she was one of the Philadelphia 11, 11 women who became ordained in the Episcopal Church two years before it explicitly affirmed and authorized the ordination of women into the priesthood. Through this courageous act, Wikipedia, and thus the world, knows Reverend Carter and her colleagues to this day. However, her becoming continues. Here in our community, she founded the Free Rain Center for Therapeutic Horseback Riding, and she is chair of the Religious Affairs Committee of the NAACP here in Brevard, and she does so much more. and we will hear from her shortly. You use covenant to affirm and promote the worth and dignity of every human being. 
And in that spirit, let's begin our service in the sanctuary with a brief and loving greeting. Good morning, I'm Janice Cannon, and I will be doing a slight introduction here. It's gonna be a little different than usual, though. We'll talk about creativity, the ability to produce or develop original work theories, techniques, or thoughts. A creative individual typically displays originality, imagination, and expressiveness. Creative thinking refers to the mental processes leading to a new invention or a solution to a problem or even a new life path. I'm going to add the words, add to the words mental processes by including the ability to recognize and utilize synchronistic events, also known as guidance from the universe. And I'll also include the word courage because our theme today is courage in creativity. Much attention is paid to creative ideas and the outcomes, but the internal process of the creator isn't discussed that much. Our first choral piece is Song of Miriam, written by Elaine Hagenberg, the woman who also wrote a U UTC favorite, Oh, love. You know which one I mean? The text for Song of Miriam is by Rabbi Ruth Zone, who uses a metaphor of music to describe the process of undertaking a new creative path. She speaks to the self-doubt, the light, and the courage of all women. Before we sing, I will share with you the creative process for parts of this service. We have been gifted with the energy, courage, and downright persistence of each of our participants, Carter, Vanessa, the 10 women in the choir, Carlene, and myself. The interdependence of all these women have created what you are experiencing today. There wasn't much discussion between Carter, Vanessa, and myself in, about the service in our initial meeting. We only mentioned creativity as the topic. But a few weeks later, when we finally met to collaborate, it turned out we were all on the same page. How did that happen? Choosing the music for this service was another perfect example of synchronicity. Normally, it takes me hours and sometimes days to find music that fits the theme for, for what service I'm going to be singing. And um, this time, I pulled up YouTube to start looking. These three songs were on the first page. That is unheard of. Sometimes words get lost in the music. And rather than putting the words on the screen, Vanessa and I decided to read aloud the words to each of these songs before they're sung. Song of Miriam directly reflects the experiences of the choir, Carlene and me, over the last six weeks of preparing this music. I've heard everything from, what are you trying to do, kill us? <laughs> and several people saying, I don't know if I can do this, including a 50-year master's degree pianist. <laughs> Needless to say, she did it, we did it, you're going to hear it. Um, 
But as we practiced uh, over the weeks, I watched with awe, touched to the core, as all of us rose to the occasion to learn this difficult music. Here are the lyrics to Song of Miriam. I stand at the sea and turn to face the desert stretching endless and still. My eyes are dazzled, the sky brilliant blue. Sunburnt sands, unyielding white, my hands turn to dove wings. My arms reach for the sky, reach for the sky. I want to sing, to sing the song, rising, rising, ah. I stop. Where are the words? I stop. Where is the melody? In a moment of panic, my eyes go blind. Can I take a step without knowing a destination? Will I falter? Will I fall? Will the ground sink away from under me? The song still unformed, how can I sing? To take the first step to sing a new song, to close one's eyes and dive into unknown waters, for a moment knowing nothing, risking all. But then to discover the waters are friendly the ground is firm, the song rises again. Out of my mouth come words lifting the wind. I hear for the first time the song in my heart, silent, unknown even to me, the song in my heart. Now we'll sing it for you.
we now move more deeply into our worship service by lighting the chalice, symbol of Unitarian Universalism. We have unison words by the late Reverend Betts Wienicke, who founded the UU Church in Live Oak, California. And uh, we thought these words were very appropriate. As we gather together this morning, may we learn to recognize and affirm the pieces of possibility, the bits of good we bring. May we encourage rather than control, love rather than possess, enable rather than envy, allowing our individual gifts to weave a patchwork of peace, the soft deep blue of sensitivity and understanding, the red energy of creativity, the white heat of convictions, the risky, fragile green of new growth, the golden flashes of gratitude, the warm rose of love. Each of us is indispensable if we are to minister to a broken and wounded world. Together, in our gathered diversity, we form the whole. So be it. And it's time for our wisdom for all ages. So I'm speaking to all. Today, here in the sanctuary, we are talking about creating. And we will talk about women creating together. We could talk about the person who invented Wi-Fi or the one who invented GPS, you know, the map that you carry in your car or your phone and helps you find your way. Or speaking of phones, we could talk about telecommunications. Or speaking of cars, we could talk about windshield wipers. Or speaking of computery things, we could talk about computer programming. And if we talk about any of those things, we'll be talking about women. Because women brought about each of those things. But we're going to focus on one particular woman named Wangari Mathi. We're going to be reading the story, Wangari's Trees of Peace. This is an older book, but I want you to know that the Green Belt movement that Wangari Mathi started in Kenya is still alive and, and running. Our book is by Jeanette Winter. <coughs> And now I see why Kevin is challenged by this sometimes. Boop, 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 boop. There we go. Wangari lives under an umbrella of green trees in the shadow of Mount Kenya in Africa. She watches the birds in the forest where she and her mother go to gather firewood for cooking. And she helps harvest the sweet potatoes, sugarcane, and maize from the rich soil. Wangari shines in school. So when she grows tall like the trees in the forest, she wins a scholarship to study in America. Six years later, her studies over, Wangari returns to her Kenya home and sees a change. What has happened, she wonders. Where? are the trees. Wangari sees women bent from hauling firewood miles and miles from home. She sees barren land where crops once grew. And where are the birds? Thousands of trees have been cut down to make room for buildings. And no one planted new trees in their place. 
Will all of Kenya become a desert? She wonders as her tears fall. Wangari thinks about the broken, barren land and thinks, I can begin to replace some of the trees. So she starts with nine seedlings. Watching the seedlings take root gives Wangari the idea to plant more, to start a farm for baby trees and nursery. In an open space, she plants row after row of the tiny trees. And of course, the next thing to do is to gather with the other women. She gives each one a seedling. Our lives will be better when we have trees again. We are planting seeds of hope. The women spread out over their village, planting the tiny trees in long rows, like a green belt stretching over the land. The government men laugh. Women can't do this, they say. It takes trained foresters to plant trees. The women ignore the laughter and keep planting. They are able to be paid a small amount for each seedling still living after three months, the first time they have earned money. Word travels like wind rustling through the leaves about the green returning to Wangari's village. Soon, women in other villages and towns and cities in Kenya are planting long rows of seedlings too. But the cutting continues. Wangari stands tall as an oak to protect the old trees still remaining. We need a park. We need farms more than we need an office tower. We need water, clean water. But the government men of Kenya disagree. Wangari blocks their way, so they hit her with clubs. They put her in jail. And still she stands tall, right is right, even if you're alone. But Wangari is not alone. Talk of the trees spreads over all of Africa like ripples in Lake Vic Victoria. And over the world, incidentally, she won the Nobel Prize for her work. More women hear the talk and plant even more seedlings in longer and longer rows. The seedlings take root and grow tall until there are more than 30 million trees where there were none. The umbrella of green in Kenya returns. Women walk tall, their backs straight, for now they can gather firewood nearer to home. The land is no longer barren. Sweet potatoes, sugar cane, and maize grow again in the rich red earth. The whole world hears of Wangari's trees and of her army of women who planted them. And if you were to climb to the very top of Mount Kenya, you would see the millions of trees growing below you and the green Wangari and the women brought back to Africa. May it be so. Do we have a chalice for the children today? Yes, Birdie. Today, as we've said, our theme has to do with courage. The word comes from the French word for heart. And creativity and collaboration, that interdependence, that is our theme for the month of April. 
paraphrasing our chalice lighting words, we bring our gifts, not just from our wallets and purses, but from our hearts to this sacred place. Out of our many colored gifts, the red energy of creativity, the white heat of conviction, the fragile green of growth, we create a patchwork quilt of peace, a rainbow tapestry of loving justice. So we don't ask this of our visitors, unless you really want to, but please, the rest of us, let's be generous as we're able and contribute as our ushers pass the baskets. If you place cash or a check into the envelope, that goes to our charitable partner for the month of April, the Children's Center. And if we could get that slide back, thank you. Um, cash or checks in the basket itself will go directly to UUTC to support its mission. And know that your gifts are received with much gratitude. The words of our prayer are from Gary Kowalski, who serves the UU Church of Taos, New Mexico, and is the author of Science and the Search for God. First, though, we'll recognize the joys and sorrows of our hearts. So breathe and center yourself for a time of prayer, meditation, and reflection. Creator of all, living in all, whom many call goddess or God. We honor the joys and sorrows being experienced by all in our community. 
We honor the joy of the milestone of a birthday for our beloved choir director, John Austin. We honor celebrations and griefs that are as yet unvoiced and those that are shared online in our chat. We honor them all. Our time is short here on the earth. Around us swirl immensities of time and space, a universe infinite in all directions. How small our hopes and cares seem amid the panorama of creation. Yet we are not separate from the cosmos, but have evolved and grown out of it like the leaves of a tree or the waves upon the sea. And our thoughts are its thoughts, our lives a manifestation of never-ending vitality, our spirits a microcosm of the beauty and creativity of the whole. Fill us then with reverence and compassion for all who are our kin, Cloud and sun, sibling and cousin, the multitude of beings who share this improbable and never to be repeated moment. All expressions like ourselves of the mind at large, the spirit at play, the dynamism at work in whom we live and move and whom we will never know. Amen and blessed be. Now, before you hear from the women's choir once more, I'm going to read the words put to this exuberant music by Marie-Claire Seinden. <clears throat> the reading is Light by Rabindranath Tagore, Indian poet, writer, playwright, composer, philosopher, social reformer, and painter. And in his spare time, Tagore, who in 1913 was the first non-European and the first lyricist to win the Nobel Prize for Literature for the English translation of Gitanjoli. In Gitanjoli 57, Light, we hear a soul opened to the energy of the universe, the light mysterious and miraculous, reflecting the way women like Wangari Mati and others, tune in to each other and their natural surroundings of, and the universe, reaching beyond the limitations of their individual thought. And, um, and here is Tagore's love song to the universe. Translated into English, Gitanjali means song offerings. Light. My light, the world-filling light, the eye-kissing light, the heart-sweetening light. Ah, the light dances, my darling, the chords the, at the center of my life. The light strikes, my darling, the chords of my love. The sky opens, the wind runs wild. Laughter passes over the face of the earth. The butterflies spread their sails on the sea of light. Lilies and jasmines surge upon the crest of the waves of light. The light is shattered into gold on every cloud, and it scatters gems in profusion. Mirth 
spreads from leaf to leaf, my darling, and gladness without measure. The heaven's river has drowned its banks, and the flood of joy is abroad. And now, light.
And now um, our guest speaker, I welcome to the stage, the Reverend Carter Hayward. Well, wow. <laughs> Carleen, Janice, Vanessa, I am so honored, Catherine, <laughs> I'm so honored to be among you and uh, be back up here as I am from time to time. I'm usually down there, which I love. <laughs> um, and of course, last night, just as I was thinking, I was all ready to go and had nothing more to think about until this morning. Uh, the news came about Iran's attack on Israel, which happily, at least for now, did not amount to too much in terms of the human toll it has taken. However, we don't know, of course, and the story is not over. But I found myself having to stop and breathe very deeply and close my eyes, and I conjured up an image of wisdom. Sophia, a great, strong woman with her arms wrapped around the world. She who cares nothing about who is Muslim or Christian or Jew or pagan, or atheist, or Buddhist, or anything else. Nothing whatsoever about our religious identities, if indeed we have any. The one, the only one, the only one with the wisdom and with the courage to create small sparkles of hope out of fear, and little beads of peace out of violence and war. As I pondered, whether or not to preach what I had already planned, I realized that perhaps these totally inadequate words of mine, which are uplifted by your hearts and graced by the remarkable music we have been sharing, might serve as just a small sparkle of hope and a little bead of peace, if indeed we can go forth from here carrying the courage to create. So, here I go. One of my strongest memories from my trips to Nicaragua in the early 1980s was the sign over the door at the Ministry of Culture that read, Todos son artistas, which is short for all persons are artists. All, not just a few, all, not just those who make glorious music, or paintings, or fabric designs, or festive murals, all. I want to invite everyone here today, just for a, maybe one minute if, if, or, or less, <laughs> to go inside yourselves and just think for a moment about a time in your life when you knew you were an artist. If you have to, invent. <laughs> but don't, don't come up with nothing. Invent if you must. Okay. Something I treasure about my still young experience of Unitarian Universalism is that somehow everything seems to connect with everything else. Regardless of when and where we enter these doors, regardless of which Sunday we happen to be here, we have Jackie preaching on hope several weeks ago. 
hope surrounded by trust that there is energy and awareness among us. Energy, trust, resilience. And then two weeks ago, I think it was, Reverend Bob reminding us what Easter can signal even to Unitarian Universalists, really to all of us, whatever our faith tradition, if any, that a transformational energy is what creates empty tombs. A transformational energy is what creates empty tombs and brings new life, shall we say hope, to thirsty little pods or souls like ours. And the music, my goodness, the music, John, Carlene, Janice, others of you, always this music is so glorious. This choir singing and all of us singing God of many names, which is why I first walked, why I stayed once I came in these doors having, hearing me, a Christian, hearing a congregation sing God of many names. It blew me away and called me back. All of you, all of us singing Alleluia. And this morning, music about a little girl who sings her heart out and then cries because not everyone can sing. Imagine kids in Gaza right now. Imagine kids in Jerusalem. Imagine kids in Tehran. This morning, this very morning. And then we hear about the light around us, between us, over and under us, within us, the light inspiring our music, inspiring our hope, inspiring our transformational energies. And now today, our courage as citizens of this terribly confused nation with its thousands upon thousands of confused counties and communities like ours. Now, when Janice asked me to first to speak on women's creativity, I paused and found myself deep inside wondering, well, why just women? Why not just plain creativity? Because certainly it transcends gender. So I am going to speak on women's creativity, but also creativity. And you'll see how they come together very quickly. Creativity is the first sacred act, of course. The first sacred act, uh, sacred and divine and quite, quite human and other creaturely. Creativity. But remember, creativity can serve evil as well and has too often in our collective global history done so as musicians played Bach and Wagner while people were gassed in Germany and white Christians sang and danced at public lynchings. <coughs> I've seen pictures of it, I'm sure you have too. White Christians singing and dancing at public lynchings of our black neighbors. So creativity is a morally neutral capacity arising out of and serving good or evil depending upon its context, its doers, and its effects. So in realms of art and creativity, as everywhere else, we must be on moral alert. How we can, how we must never lose sight of the justice love to which we aspire morning by morning and day by day. An interesting character I met while sorting out definitions of creativity was one William Childs a contemporary, maybe about my age, maybe younger, about whom I could find little other than some short essays he wrote on go golfing and home repair, and quite a few on creativity itself, including one piece in which he said that the four pillars of creativity are wonderment, courage, authenticity, and curiosity. And I thought, that's not bad. Wonderment, courage, authenticity, and curiosity. At the end of each of these essays, Childs describes himself as a right-brained creative making his way in an overcrowded left-brain world. I rather like that, and I really liked these pillars of creativity, wonderment, courage, authenticity, and curiosity. It's important to realize that in a patriarchal, overcrowded, left-brained world, it is often women, and also often misfit, 
odd, we might even suggest queer men who are most often creative, people who must draw deeply from wellsprings of wonderment, courage, authenticity, and curiosity to survive, simply to survive, whether at the palette or on the keyboard or on the stage or at the stove or at the sewing machine or in the factory trying to make pieces fit or in the barn trying to stitch together the old saddle because who can afford a new one? Creativity. Very often women and queer men have to lean into and produce out of their creative wellsprings in order to survive sometimes bodily, often psychologically, and I would suggest always spiritually. My black colleague, social ethicist Katie Geneva Cannon has said that in America, black women's creativity has always been making ways out of no way. Black grandmothers and black mothers, black aunts and sisters making ways out of no way, planting, gathering food, cooking, sewing, bartering with neighbors, concocting herbal remedies for what ails them and their children, calculating expenses for their families' well-being, as often as not creating ways out of no ways to survive from slavery through servitude, in hunger and sickness, in hopelessness and impossible situations, making ways out of no way to keep bodies and souls alive. I think Childs had it right. For any one of us, for all of us, for black women and all women and all men and gender fluid siblings, our creativity is born of wonderment, of courage, of authenticity and curiosity. It is a dimension of who we are that we and others must cultivate and tend as long as we hope to be able to drink from its wellsprings. Now, undeniably, some people are born creative. We know that. Mozart, Clara Schumann, Stevie Wonder, Dolly Parton, Celine Dion are among the child prodigies we know about, we've heard about, we've experienced their creativity. Most prodigies in arts and sciences, geniuses with numbers, strings, paint, are mostly unknown to us. Who among us has ever heard of the black German child Achim Kamara, a two-year-old violinist who gave his first concert in Berlin when he was three years old? Or the white American child Jacob Barnett, who entered Purdue University at age 10 and published his first book in physics three years later. Children whose creative intelligence was born in their bones. Even such prodigies, however, need to be nurtured. Their creativity needs to be encouraged and shaped. How much more so the rest of us, people who need to be encouraged even to imagine that we are artists. How do we do it? How do we nurture creativity among ourselves, our own and that of others? In her poem upon which Elaine Hagenberg based the song of Miriam, which we have just heard, Rabbi Ruth Zahn offers us clues, and I will get to the poem in a minute. But first, a word about Miriam herself, and this gets me all hot and bothered. And this from renowned Hebrew scripture scholar Phyllis Tribble. Uh, who was at the seminary where I studied as a uh, young, younger seminarian, Union Seminary. I quote now from the Jewish Women's Archives. Miriam is best known for helping to deliver Moses at the Nile River and leading the Hebrew women in singing, dancing, and playing drums after crossing the Red Sea. Later, she and her brother Aaron challenged the actions and the authority of Moses. She understands leadership to embrace diverse voices, female and male, but the price of speaking out is severe. God punishes her, after which she never speaks again, nor is she spoken to. Centuries later, 
Prophecy remembers her as the equal of Moses and Aaron and representing God before the people and as the inaugurator of a performance and composition tradition of song, drums, and dances in Israel. Leaving aside just for a moment the assertion that God punishes Miriam but not her brother Aaron for challenging male authority, that is their younger brother Moses, let's imagine this young woman Miriam whom the poet Ruth Zahn envisioned standing at the sea and turning to face the desert, stretching endless and still. And these give us, I think, our clues for how to encourage one another and be encouraged ourselves. The God in whom she has always believed or tried to believe has cast her out without her brothers, without her people whom she had led in song and dance as they pass safely through the Red Sea. No thanks to the patriarchal deity, Miriam stands alone at the edge of the sea facing the endless and still desert. Remember here Katie Cannon's statement that black women's creativity is making ways out of no way? Well, Miriam becomes not only the first Hebrew female prophet, but moreover the first Judeo-Christian and Muslim black woman prophet who, because she was authentic, because she was strong and outspoken, finds herself cast out. Because she was these things, she is cast out. Because she is authentic, she finds herself outside the circle, having to make a way out of no way. Imagine for a moment how many Muslim and Jewish and other women in Gaza and in the West Bank find themselves in such a situation this very day? Just imagine having to make ways out of no way. According to the poet Ruth Zahn, in this moment, Miriam's eyes are dazzled. Her hands turn to dove wings. Her song begins to rise within her. Her eyes go blind. And she asked, will I falter? Will I fall? Will the ground sink away from under me? Her song still unformed. She asked herself, how can I sing? Miriam has been filled with wonderment and now with fear. So only her courage, only her courage can enable her to take the first step towards singing a new song. What her courage involves is closing her eyes and diving into unknown waters and for a moment knowing nothing, risking all. That is her courage and her curiosity and it is always ours when we are most creative. Diving into the unknown, knowing nothing, risking everything. And because of her willingness to risk and to dive into unknown waters, Miriam discovers the waters are friendly and the ground is firm and the song rises again. And according to the poet, Miriam hears for the first time the song that has been in her heart, silent and unknown even to her. This part of the story, the poem, in which the courageous Miriam discovers herself in friendly waters and on firm ground, may stretch your imagination as it does mine, beyond the pale perhaps, since so often courageous black, brown, immigrant, queer, and other outsiders do not find themselves in friendly waters. Unless, and this is a big unless, unless we discover ourselves among sisters and brothers and siblings and allies including very often strangers who share our values and who are willing to share our journey or take us in. It is that collectivity, our finding one another, that gives us the strength to find that song within us, I believe. And that may be part of the poem that the rabbi Ruth Zahn left out or leaves to our imagination. <coughs> because I don't think we can count on finding friendly waters when we dive into the unknown. We might. It might be a wonderful lucky day for us, but then again, we might not. 
The poem and the song of Miriam urge us to open our eyes to our allies, wherever we may find them, our friends, those who will accompany us, those who will tell us to keep our courage, men and women like the great Bishop Bob DeWitt who ordained the 11 women, who ordained us all and always wrote us, keep your courage. Every letter was signed, keep your courage. This is a story of creativity sparked in Miriam's case by a young woman's abuse and suffering, her authenticity, her wonderment, her curiosity, her fear of the unknown, and her great courage to dive in regardless and find allies who would encourage her and accompany her across the desert or take her in and give her shelter. But now, as I move towards some closure in a couple of minutes, I would not be my authentic self if I did not say something about this God who has punished Miriam by casting her out of her community, including out of her relationship with her brothers, Aaron and Moses, the one she saved. Imagine that. She saved the life of the baby Moses, and now she is cast out, and he is left in God's inner circle. What is she supposed to say? Thank you. <laughs> what is he supposed to say or do? Nothing? This I remind you, this God we're hearing about here who cast Miriam out and saves Aaron and Moses for greater purposes, presumably in his patriarchal design, is the same God who later in Hebrew scriptures instructs Abraham and his wife Sarah to cast their maidservant Hagar and her son Ishmael out into the wilderness to fend for themselves, and Hagar has to make a way out of no way. And it's often considered by black women, their first black American women, their first prophetic figure, Hagar. Genesis 16 to 21, you'll find about Hagar. This is also the same God who instructs Abraham to kill his son Isaac because God somehow wants proof of Abraham's loyalty and who changes his mind only at the last moment, Genesis 22. This is the same God who allows the warrior Jephthah to kill his daughter because Jephthah has promised God he will slay his only child if God will just allow him victory, military victory over his enemies, Judges 11. Moving on into the New Testament, what many Christians believe is the bedrock of Christian faith, this is the same God who sacrifices his son Jesus on the cross, thereby purchasing salvation for all Christians, or perhaps, if we are more universalist, all people. What kind of God is this, I have to ask? Surely not one in whom justice-loving universalists, Unitarians, Christians, Jews, Muslims, or anyone else can put our faith and expect kindness or mercy, or forgiveness, or any other spiritual gift that can heal and liberate or generate in us the courage to really create. Who the hell needs or wants such a God? <laughs> so a word here about who or what really God is as a sacred source or a moral beacon. Here, toward the end of a sermon in which the best I can offer you is my interpretation of readings, lyrics, and so forth, let me make one statement of objective fact. I believe it is a statement of objective fact. Hebrew scripture, like the New Testament, and like the scriptures of all primary patriarchal religions in this world, were composed by those men given authority by their religious communities to make pronouncements of truth, especially regarding God, who was held up as the ultimate author and arbiter of truth, religion, morality, rules, and so forth. That is a fancy way of saying that the Bible was written by men to support the authority of dominant race and class men in service of their male God whom they have concocted in their image. That is a fact. Amen. <laughs> Patriarchal religious imagery, including images of God, can and often does have little of anything to do with justice making 
and with love among humans in communities that include women and children and animals and non-dominant human males, not to mention all those other people who live outside our communities. We need to be clear that the biblical presentations of Miriam were written by men to support the authority of men and of their patriarchal God. Miriam's fate would have been as much a non-issue for these men and their God as pregnant women are to the Supreme Court of the United States. <laughs> women mean little or to nothing to all these men, just as they did to the framers of the Abrahamic religious traditions, including the misogynist foundations of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And I'm using the word men generically here to include those women, well, white men, white elite men, but also including black, brown, female, and other people who make alliance with them and for whatever reason feel a need to support those white men in power. So there, that's why we have a lot of women who do not seem to love women very much. And a lot of black people in our society who don't seem to love black people very much or identify with them and so forth and so on. But you get my meaning. It's still a largely white, elite, male, dominant class who would like to rule over all of us and certainly shape our religious traditions. From my earliest days in seminary, I've known that good preachers spend as much time preaching against the text as for it. But it's taken me well into my old age to realize that faithful preachers who are Jews, Christians, or Muslims, or for that matter, Unitarians, must spend much of our most creative energy preaching against the ongoing images of violent, woman-hating, white supremacist deities we have inherited and are still having to deal with every day of our lives. This is a violent deity who oppresses women like Miriam because we dare to speak up and claim our own bodily integrity, a contemptuous deity who supports and tolerates the abuse or neglect of brown or black or Asian or immigrant or gay, gay lesbian, trans, other queer people, poor people, differently abled people or animals on this earth. If a, this deity exists, he is not worth our bother. But yet we must bother because there is so much power that he still rules over us in this country and elsewhere in the world. In this context, our best spiritual energies, that is our most courageous, creative spiritual energies, which root and ground our moral power, will always be on behalf of the justice-loving, transformative powers that move us to rebel against such violent deities and the people who worship them. In closing, I call us back to the water's edge and ask you to join Miriam and me in facing the desert, which stretches endless before us, say between now and November. Can we be our most authentic selves? Can we acknowledge the fear that all people of goodwill and good sense experience today? That is to say, we're not in touch if we're not afraid. Can we just let this be in the sense of keeping us honest and on our toes, alert? Can we allow ourselves to be guided by our senses of curiosity and wonderment and see where these openings may lead us together? Can we draw our courage from those who have gone before us and those who go with us now? Can we and will we look to each other for strength and hope and the courage to create? Sisters and brothers and siblings, let us turn our backs on the God who has cast us out. And as a brother from Nazareth once suggested, let us walk away from all violent, obscene images of God and of those who follow such a God, and let us shake the dust from our feet as we go. I love that image. That says to me, you know, it's a very sort of polite, non-obscene way of saying something. <laughs> <laughs> so on we go, shaking the dust from our feet, working, praying, singing, dancing, moving on together. We will find our way. Regardless of what happens, we will find our way if we are together, sisters, brothers, siblings, 
the water into which we dive will be friendly because we will find one another there. And the ground on which we stand will be firm because we will be standing together on it. And we ain't going to let nobody turn us around. We ain't going to let nobody push us around and turn us down and stomp our movements for justice love into the ground. Amen. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Now, please rise in body or spirit for our closing hymn, We Are. ourselves beyond all religion into the core of our humanity, push down into our soul where we connect with one another, with friends and yes, in ways we do not understand with enemies as well, with Fraser furs and snow, stones and snakes, slimy and tough and dangerous and endangered, every one of us here, all of us present, Beginning together, where it all starts in these wildly creative bursts of energy. Bursts of energy like stars and imagination. Go well. Amen. <laughs>